On September 2nd, 1987, a man by the name of Kevin had decided to leave his home in Ross River, which is an unincorporated community in Yukon, Canada, for a little outdoor recreation. Well, the plans were to go moose hunting, but little did Kevin realize that he himself would become the hunted. So Kevin left town by himself on his motorbike early that morning and took off up the North Canole Roadway. He was destined for an area between Sheldon Lake and McPass, where a co-worker and another friend were to meet him the following day. And there, in a small trailer at Dewhurst Creek, they planned to spend three days before heading back home. It sounded like the perfect trip. But folks, we know this channel, right? We know the content. We know that things are about to go awry. Well, the morning that Kevin left, the weather had turned for the worse. The temperature was dropping as if that wasn't bad enough. It began to rain gently at first, but slowly and steadily increasing. Since it showed no signs of stopping, Kevin's only choice was to pull over, put on more clothing, and continue on with his journey. Now, in hindsight, Kevin realizes that he had a strange feeling the entirety of the trip. He later remembered, while driving from Ross River to the trailer, he had a feeling that something unusual might happen, but he never expected what was about to happen. So Kevin reached the trailer about a half hour or so before darkness fell. He's soaked to the bone, he's cold, and he's exhausted. And so he lits a fire, dries, and warms himself. And after a quick bite to eat, goes straight to bed, eager to get up on an early start to his hunting trip. Now the night goes by without pass and by daybreak, the weather was clear and the rain had stopped. So Kevin began dressing and loaded up his firearm on his bike and took off back down the road toward Mac Pass sometime between 6 and 6.30 in the morning. Everything was such a welcome change from the miserable drive up, so he allowed himself to just soak everything in the beautiful picturesque surroundings of the Canadian wilderness, puttering along no faster than 10 miles per hour. All the while, he scouted possible hunting locations, always keeping an eye out for any sign of breaks in the underbrush that, well, might indicate a moose was nearby. Now, after only a few miles of traveling, Kevin felt the need to use the bathroom. So he pulls his bike to a stop, dismounts, and begins to urinate. Now, after he starts, he looks up and took in the mountainsides and the valleys, all bathed in the warm glow of the sun, which was beginning to now bake off some of the cold from the night prior. But this is right when Kevin saw it. In his account of the experience, which he shared with researcher Martin Jacek, Kevin would say this, I was standing just in front of my bike watching the mountains to the south when I noticed to the left of me, out of the corner of my eye, what I first thought was an airplane. It was 400 to 500 yards away and about the size of a DC-3 plane or a full-size school bus. It was traveling north to south at about 40 yards above ground and moving maybe 30 kilometers per hour. Right away, I thought, boy, is he low. Now I blinked my eyes because I couldn't make out any tail fin or wings. It had what looked like portholes all along the side of it. It was cigar shaped with a gray strip down the middle and a dark green on top and bottom. I thought to myself, something's wrong with this picture. And then I realized, there was no sound. If it was an airplane, the roar would have filled the entire valley. Now, Kevin watched as before his very eyes, the object seemed to dim in and out of existence, almost like it was partially dematerializing for a moment or two before returning to a solid state. Now, this happened a few times before a thought came to Kevin's mind. Oh, I don't think I should be seeing this. It's a UFO and probably doesn't want to be seen. Now, as gracefully as he could, Kevin zips up his pants and crouched by the side of the road, taking cover in some tall grass on the shoulder. Now, as he watched the UFO traveling in front of the backdrop of the mountains, he felt something against his chest. 
It was his camera, snugly nestled in his shirt pocket beneath his jacket, and so Kevin immediately starts reaching for his camera, eager to snap a photograph of this unbelievable sight. But as he did so, he felt what he described as a calming feeling wash over him. Kevin says that this wave of emotion convinced him that there was no need to take a picture and what he was seeing wasn't a big deal at all and everything is just calm and cool and collective. We're all mellowed out, right? Kevin said afterwards he thought it was just very bizarre behavior, but he kept two cameras on the go at all times and was always on the lookout for the perfect photo opportunity. To think a UFO photo is not important is clearly insane. Now, it clearly sounds like Kevin was maybe being manipulated by forces beyond his control. Now, simply abandoning this plan, he stayed in the moment, watching the shape as it just disappeared behind a cone-shaped hill. It was not seen again. Now, finally, he stood, relishing how lucky he had been to have seen something so miraculous. I mean, he felt excited like he had gotten away with murder, like something that he shouldn't have seen. Now, that was when he realized he was not alone. Kevin was standing beside his bike when he hears this loud metallic right behind him around the corner. Now, right away, he thought, somebody must be here. I've got to tell them what I've seen. But the noise he heard sounded like a heavy trunk lid on a car slamming shut. He quickly walked along the edge of the road to the corner to see who was there. Now, when Kevin rounded the bend, he was terrified by what he saw. There, no more than 20 yards away, stood a pair of figures waiting for him among the tall grass and bushes. Both wore blue jumpsuits over their thin bodies and neither stood more than five feet tall. But the most remarkable thing about these intruders, however, were their heads. Both sported pointed gray faces with enormous eyes, but the faces were not human. They were the faces of insects. Kevin says this, I immediately thought, they're not little green men, they're grasshopper people. At that same instant, the one on the left raised his left hand to his waist, which held some type of flashlight device, and I saw a bright flash of light come from it. I instantly felt paralyzed and was convinced the time had stopped. Everything was black, no sound. It seemed like time stood still and nothing existed but me, like I was pulled from reality. It was the most absolute quiet ever imagined. I was really scared and tried to yell, no, but all that came out was this gnarly growl. I had the sensation of hurtling skyward at a terrific speed. I felt that I was being stretched as if my feet were on the ground and my upper body was 20 feet above, my whole body shooting skyward. This is the last thing that Kevin remembers about that particular morning. The next thing he knew, he was back where he started on the side of the road in the Canadian wilderness. The only difference was that the pair of insectoids were nowhere to be seen and his hands were shaking. All Kevin wanted to do in that moment was to turn and flee before he could be taken again. He remembers being especially confused when, upon turning back in the direction of his motorbike, he couldn't find it right away. And that was when he realized that it had been somehow moved to the opposite side of the road. No matter what had happened just now, Kevin knew that he had not turned his bike in that direction. Still, that was something to ponder at another time. His primary goal was to get the heck back to Dodge, or in this case, his trailer. And so Kevin rushed over to his vehicle and to his horror, could not find his keys. And so he's scrambling, trying to figure out what he did. And I mean, he always made a habit of leaving them in the ignition so that he wouldn't lose them while out in the bush. And so after a few moments, he realized that he had held them in his hand, which is not something any of us would find odd, but something Kevin never did while on a hunting trip ever. And so Kevin hopped up on the seat, thrust the key into the ignition and started up his bike. And as he raced home, 
he knew that something was very wrong. I was feeling scared and amazed at the same time and then noticed that all the shadows of the trees were pointing in a different direction than that of the morning sun. About 15 minutes later, I was at the trailer. Half an hour later, it was dark. I thought, no way, I only left here an hour ago. What's going on? Martin Jacek would later determine that Given the time of year, this probably meant that Kevin had around a dozen hours of missing time. Now, Kevin tried to busy himself around the trailer, but it was no use. His mind was racing. He was very confused. Nothing made sense, and he had no idea what he would tell his friends. And so he soon came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was to put the whole thing behind him, to not mention it, forget it, and hopefully move on with a successful hunting trip. Now, his mind had just settled down when Kevin decided to brew a pot of coffee. And that's when he hears something, a low, soft humming sound that seemed to kind of just vibrate everything in the trailer just ever so slightly. He didn't know what it meant, but he had his suspicions and did his best not to look out the windows for fear that his kidnappers had finally returned. Now, finally, after about 10 minutes, the noises stopped. And later, Kevin tried to go to sleep, but he couldn't. Now, every time he had closed his eyes, flashbacks of what had transpired on the road would just slowly creep into his mind. And at first, he could only really remember just bits and pieces here and there. But the following day, Kevin's friends had arrived. He did not say a word to them about what had happened. And when it was time to go home, Kevin remained behind at the trailer for a day or two for some solitary duck hunting, allowing himself to just digest everything and be alone in his thoughts. Now, to his relief, nothing else strange had transpired. Now, slowly... Kevin began to kind of piece together what happened during his missing time episode after the insectoids had zapped him with their device. Snippets of the intervening incident came when he least expected it. Some of the clearest memories emerged around 10 years later when he was living and working in New Zealand. From time to time, Kevin would work with the lathe, shaping corks, and the incessant drone of the tool seemed to kind of just lull him into this state of mind that would jog his memory. Now, after a decade of spontaneous flashes, Kevin began to piece together a narrative. He remembers seeing the rivers, the forests, the mountains flying past him, and when he finally came to a stop, this deep, suffocating darkness would surround him. The blackness pulled away, revealing the face of a stereotypical gray alien, telepathically assuring him that he had nothing to fear. The being was accompanied by three or four others. Kevin was told that he had already been examined. Besides a strange feeling on his hands, everything about his body felt normal. The Gray then asked Kevin if, if he wished to see his home world. He agreed and was shown the solar system through a large, gigantic window. After declining an offer to take a tour of outer space, Kevin was told that he would be forced to forget his experience. The Gray then handed him a clear glass, partially filled with a yellow liquid. He took three sips, and the next thing he knew, Kevin was standing right beside his bike along the North Canal Road, terrified with no memory of what had happened. Now, apparently, Kevin's amnesia wore off over the years, and one thing about his experience had a more permanent effect. Kevin would say this, When I got back to Ross River, I was thinking about the sensation in my hands when I sat up on the bed with the beings. I looked down at my palms and was startled to see a scoop mark in the palm of each hand. Now, I had not seen these before. 
Over the next couple of years, I asked two doctors and four nurses if they knew what this was and they all said no. They had never seen anything like it before. In September of 2000, I asked my doctor about it and he actually said yes, he knows of it and he told me it specifically was a condition called Dupuytren's contracture. However, they had no idea what caused it. Coincidence? I don't know. I still have them. Kevin's experience on the North Canal Road is one of countless confrontations with a race of creatures that have plagued human beings for decades, if not centuries or millennia. Well, today we are more familiar with extraterrestrials who correspond to the typical gray alien, you know, large heads, large eyes, spindly bodies, and hairless gray or white skin. People also report encounters with creatures that can only be described as insectoid. Now, sometimes they are compared to grasshoppers, as in Kevin's case. Other times they seem to most closely resemble gigantic praying mantises. Now, the idea that species from other planets might closely resemble insects is shockingly old. In fact, as early as 1896, Francis Galton, cousin of famed naturalist Charles Darwin, had proposed the idea, and within a few years, it was then normalized, excuse me, it was then formalized in an academic paper by Edward Mason, who proposed that interplanetary life might resemble not human beings, but rather insects like dragonflies or ants. Now, since then, the insectoid meme has never left ufology, mixing with older indigenous traditions of everything from scorpion men in the Epic of Gilgamesh to ant people in the Hopi belief system. Now, over the years, mantids have emerged alongside light beings, Nordics, greys, and reptilians as one of the most common types of entities reported in alien abduction cases. Now, oftentimes, experiencers claim that they are the highest up the extraterrestrial chain of command, while other times they are seen wearing cloaks or robes. In every case, however, they exude absolute authority and a cold, calculating intellect indifferent to the suffering of their captives. Now, sometimes all of these beings can be seen together in the same encounter. Like in 1962, a woman on her way to the obstetrician appointment near Medford, New Jersey, would see a bright purple orb in the sky about the same size as the moon. Now, after pulling over for a better look, she watched it change to a variety of colors before losing consciousness. And the next thing she knew, she was at her doctor's appointment and her face was sunburned. Now, subsequent hypnotic regression reveals a startling story. Now, apparently, a portal opened up underneath the orb and drew her within to a small white room where a creature resembling a large praying mantis shoved her against the wall. A reptilian and a pair of small white beings with large eyes then would take over, showing her rows of embryos and jars before presenting her to a Nordic alien who informed her that she had just passed some sort of test. After a brief medical procedure involving a thin wire placed in her arm, she was given a vague mandate to await further instructions. Now, many ufologists believe that one of the first mantids to appear in the modern era of ufology was remembered in the March 14, 1986 hypnotic regression of Whitley Stryber, who is also the author of the 1987 bestseller, Communion. Now, according to Whitley's testimony, the gigantic bug manifested in the middle of the living room, frightening his son to death. Whitley said under hypnosis, how can it be so big? However, if one looks back over the years, we can find mantid encounters unfolding surprisingly early, even earlier than the 1962 example mentioned just a moment prior. Take, for example, the testimony of a 16-year-old witness from Langley, British Columbia, who claimed that he and his younger brother saw not one, not two, not three, but five mantids in 1947. Now that summer, the two boys were reading and resting alongside a creek near their home 
when they noticed a humming sound settling in around them. When they looked up from their books, the children spotted a domed, shining object in the sky that settled down near their very position. Now, once it landed, a door would open, revealing oversized praying mantises dressed in dull, silver-covered clothing. The primary witness stood to run away, only to have one of the mantids approach him, snatch the books from his hands, and examine it. The creature then placed an appendage on the boy's shoulder and began staring into his eyes with its own, clicking the entire time and imparting this telepathic message to not look up as they departed. Now, after examining their own craft, the mantids climbed back aboard, then took off with a deafening sound, leaving the witnesses bewildered and dehydrated. Now, another early encounter took place in the mid-1960s, either April or June of 1964 or 1965. The reason that the date is unclear is because the witness, a retired exterminator named Benjamin Davidson of Covington, Kentucky, only related mere days before his death in May of 2001. Now, he contacted ufologist Kenny Young to share his story for the first time, having never disclosed it to his wife or family members. Benjamin, who was dying of cancer, claimed that he had actually forgotten about the event for decades until sometime during the early 90s. His memory was triggered when he accidentally had singed his arm hair with a cigarette. The smell brought with it a chilling recollection from his younger days. Benjamin claimed that while employed as an exterminator in the 1960s, he would often travel between Cincinnati and Portsmouth, Ohio. Now, on one of these journeys, Benjamin found himself driving along US Route 52 late on a Sunday night. He had dropped in spontaneously on his mother and was just back on the road when he came to a clearing somewhere in the vicinity of Aberdeen or Manchester. Now, in many UFO sightings, the witness chose to stop their car and step out to investigate terrible idea, right? Well, that was not what happened to Benjamin. He had no choice. There in the middle of the blacktop sat a semicircular object, oval shaped, fashioned out of what appeared to be iron or aluminum. Now all across its surface glinted multicolored lights. Unable to go any further and astonished by what he was seeing, Benjamin drew his car to a complete stop and that was when he noticed that he wasn't alone. On either side, standing as if they were waiting for him, just as in Kevin's case along the North Canal Road, were rows of creatures. But they were not greys, nor were they the benevolent Nordics, nor even reptilians. They were, in Benjamin's description, gigantic praying mantises. Kenny Young described what happened next. Davidson said that at no time did the creatures speak to him as he was escorted into the large object that blocked his path on the roadway. The escort, he said, was non-violent. I don't know why, but I wasn't afraid. Well, the interior of this object, he said, was well lit, but he could not discern a light source. He estimated there was about 20 of the praying mantis occupants on board the object as he was taken to a table and subjected to some sort of physical examination. They scraped the skin off my hands, they clipped my fingernails, and took blood, he said during the 20-minute phone discussion. Now, this is where Benjamin's tale takes an even darker turn. Now, according to Kenny Young, the witness fell silent on the telephone as if he were wrestling with something difficult or disturbing. And finally, he said that there's something else that went on there. There was another examining table in the room. There's something else that went on there. There was another examining table in the room. And on this examining table was a little girl. That little girl was dead. I know she was dead. I didn't know who she was or where she came from, but it was quite obvious that she was deceased. Benjamin admitted that he felt helpless. There was nothing to do in his estimation. The girl was already gone. It was one of the last things he remembered about his encounter before coming back to consciousness. 
When he realized where he was, he was sitting at a traffic light near Portsmouth back in his car as if nothing ever happened. Now, Benjamin arrived late at home that night, but couldn't explain where he had been, and even if he had, no one would have believed him. As it was, his wife became convinced that he was having an extramarital affair, an accusation that strained their marriage for years to come. Now, Kenny Young, having collected Benjamin's story, expressed his interest in committing his testimony to videotape before he passed away. Benjamin's only response was, you better hurry. Now, Benjamin was correct. By the time he called several days later to coordinate a meeting, Benjamin had unfortunately passed. One of the most recent Manted encounters comes from the work of experiencer, researcher, and author Preston Dennett. Preston interviewed Nancy, a woman who claimed numerous UFO encounters all throughout her lifetime. Now, Nancy says that sometime in the middle of November of 2018, she was on the verge of sleep when she put out an invitation. Granting her UFO contacts permission to visit, they answered almost instantaneously. Nancy recalls saying that she just remembers falling asleep and that she's gone, she's out of her room, and then she's on this ship. But it's not a ship. I mean, she goes on to explain that it is, but it isn't. What Nancy means by this is that she found herself sitting on a chair in the middle of what appeared to be a recreation of a living room, complete with cheap carpet, a flat screen television, and a tan colored love seat across from her. Now on the love seat sat a man and through the two windows adorning the walls, Nancy could see a clear blue sky complete with clouds. Nancy suspects that, if not a dream, her extraterrestrial contacts were attempting to simulate a comforting environment. She looked to the man on the love seat, whom she had never seen before, despite their strange circumstances, he seemed normal enough, probably about 20 years old with brown hair. Nancy struck up a telepathic conversation with the man and said, so you're here too, she thought at him. And the young man nodded and Nancy added, why are you here? Now at this, Nancy's companion simply shrugged and thought back, I'll be okay, it'll be all right. Nancy couldn't help but agree. I mean, after all, she had literally asked for this experience. The man then stood and walked to the window. The entire time, Nancy said that it felt a bit like waiting for a doctor's appointment. She had no idea how right she was, and soon a strange looking door opened in a nearby wall, and in stepped an immense figure, nine feet tall, covered in a tough exterior shell. It looked exactly like a gigantic grayish brown praying mantis, with the exception that it had long fingers instead of claws. It stared at both of them with immense eyes. Nancy was surprised by the fact that instead of being frightened, she was actually quite calm as the mantid stepped toward the man. That was when she realized that one of its hands held a large syringe aimed for the back of the man's neck. Nancy said this, I saw exactly what it looked like. It was a big needle, except it didn't have a point. It had like a sound card one inch each way. It was really flat and you could tell it had computer stuff on it and he put it on the back of his neck. Beyond this, the mantid did nothing else, nor did the man seem to react at all. He just kept staring out the window like nothing was happening. Now, finally, the man then turned its attention to Nancy. It stared at her, making clicking noises with its mouth before taking quick, abrupt, jerky steps toward her, just as a smaller insect might. The head even reminded her of the twitchy movements a real insect might make. And the man had held up the instrument once more. It was apparent that it was going to perform the same procedure on her. Yet Nancy still wasn't scared. Instead, she stood from her chair and firmly said, no, no, but the mantid continued its approach. She backed up slightly, but the insectoid doctor continued forward, instrument in hand. <laughs> this sounds like a badly written fiction, doesn't it? But this is exactly what Nancy claimed to be her genuine experience. And so often happens in these stories that 
it's the last thing that she remembered, and the next thing she knew, she was wide awake, despite a thorough search for any new marks or scars, and she found nothing amiss, which begs the question, was this an actual experience or just a nightmare? Now, as we head off into the future, there seems to be no sign that reports of manted encounters will ever end. They have become a staple of UFO experiences and, at this point, are as much a part of the flying saucer mythology as the Greys, Reptilians, and the Nordics. Whether or not we will ever find our answers to our questions regarding these strange, mysterious creatures, that remains yet to be seen. And because you guys have made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, this video bugs me. <laughs> A little dad humor there for you guys. So I really know who made it to the end of the video and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy this kind of content, be sure to smack the crap out of that like and subscribe button so I can keep giving you guys more content just like this. And remember, as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you all in the very next episode.